chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. I'm going to talk to you this morning about Satan. <clears throat> And I want us to look and see really whether or not we are ignorant of his devices. Do we really understand Satan? Do we know who he is? Do we know how he operates? What, what do we know about him? You know, most of us know him to be a cartoon character that's red with horns and a pitchfork. And that's just something that man has devised. That's not God's word that's not there. He's a lot of things. The more we know about him, the more alert that we can be. The more we know about him, the more we can understand the power that we have. The more we know about him, the more we know that through God we can be overcomers. So I want us to look at it today. Uh, this is not a message uh, to scare you. Uh, this is a message of truth. For how can, you be, how can you be prepared for something you don't understand or know about? So we're going to look at it today. And I title this message, An Unworthy Foe. And I thought about that, An Unworthy Foe. Because most of us would certainly say that the devil is a worthy foe. And the, the less that we know about him then we would consider him a worthy foe. But the more we know about him and the more we know about God, you'll realize he's an unworthy foe. Unworthy. Unworthy. That's what we're going to look at. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for the ability to stand here this morning, and I do. I ask for your health and for your strength. God, guide us today as we share the word. Guide us today as we hear the word and let the word speak truth in our lives. And I tell you, I love you. Today we need wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Pour it upon us, Lord, so we can be wiser and understand more and know more about our enemy, the devil. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I think all of us know that God is in control of our lives. He is God. There is none like him. There is none equal to him. He has power and authority over all, including the devil. But until the time comes that the enemy, the devil, will be bound and cast into hell and tormented, day and night for eternity until that time comes he is loose and he is free to roam around on this earth but I want you to know that God has the devil in chains he is on a leash he can only do what God allows him to do he can only go where God allows him to go so he is on a leash but the Bible plainly tells us that in the last days, God is going to lengthen that leash. And even though he's on a leash, he does have power and he has more power to move about than ever before. He knows, according to the Bible, that this is the last days. He knows that his time is short. Therefore, he's got to do all that he can do in the little time that he has to trick God's people and lure them into hell. So we're going to look at this this morning. There's one other word I want you to think about. Everybody that is a Christian does not doubt Satan. If you're a Christian, you know he's real. It's only those people that 
Satan controls that does not believe that. So I'll tell you again, as Christians, we know the devil is real. We know he does possess certain powers. We know he's evil, he's wrong, and we do know that one day he'll wind up in hell, and we do know that he's trying to take us there. We do know that he's fake. He's a liar. We do know that. The only people that don't know that are those people that are controlled by him. And if he controls you, he's a master deceiver, and he'll make good look bad, bad look good. So those who are controlled by him do not understand who he is, do not understand the future concerning him, and do not understand who God is. So I would encourage you to be able to know today who the devil is and what he is and what he wants to do and what he will do because it's very important for us. Many years ago, the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, told of a time when there was a wave of petty thefts in the Soviet Union. People were stealing things. He couldn't figure it out. To stop it, he had them put guards up at all the factories there in Russia, knowing that he was going to catch these people who were stealing these small things. There was a timber works in Leningrad, and there one of the guards knew all the workers in the factory very well, but it was his job to guard that factory and watch the people to see who he could catch. The first evening, out came Prior Petrovich with a wheelbarrow containing a great bulky sack with a suspicious looking object inside. All right, Petrovich, said the guard, what have you got there? Oh, just some sawdust and some shavings. Come on, the guard said. I wasn't born yesterday. I know better than that. Pour it out right here in front of me. So the worker tipped it over, and nothing came out but sawdust and shavings. So he was allowed to put it all back again and go home. When the same thing happened every night of the week, the guard just became frustrated. Finally, his curiosity overcame him, and he said one night, Petrovich, I know you. Now tell me, what are you smuggling out of here? And if you'll tell me, I'll let you go. And Petrovich looked at me and he said, wheelbarrows. <laughs> wheelbarrows. You see, that's what Satan does. It is his job to divert us from the truth. He doesn't want us to see the wheelbarrows, so he has us to look at the sawdust. You see, he's a master deceiver. And I'm afraid that we all have been duped before. We get preoccupied with the wrong thing. And when we, when we get preoccupied, he then is able to divert our eyes from the truth. And we won't see the big picture, the wheelbarrow. We'll see the sawdust, the little things. Knowing in the end, he's trying to steal our soul. We've got to be very careful with what we see and what we think. So as we look at this this morning, I want to begin with the history. Where, where did Satan come from? Has he always been here? Who was Satan born to? Who was his mother? Who was his daddy? Very interesting, very interesting thought. And for that, I want us to go to the book of Ezekiel. And I'm going to read to you from a different translation today so you can better understand it. Ezekiel tells us this. He's talking now about Satan. Everything he says here is about Satan. And he says, you were a perfect model of perfection. Now he's talking to Satan. Keep this in mind. You were a perfect model of of perfection. You were human life at its best. You had everything that a leader would need. Immense wisdom 
and perfect beauty. You lived in Eden, God's garden. You were clothed in magnificent splendor. And you were covered in many jewels, sardis, topaz, diamonds, beryl, onyx, jasper, azure, turquoise, and emeralds. You had all the jewels that were there. All of the mountings were made of gold. Every jewel that, was, that he wore that was around him was covered and outlined in gold. And they were prepared for you on the day that you were created. Created. He wasn't born. He was created. God created the devil. Because he wasn't the devil when God created him. He became that later. Then Jesus says, I anointed you as the guardian of the garden. And I stationed you at your post to protect it. You were on the divine mountain, the holy mountain of God. There you walked among the fiery stones. And the fire here is not fire like we know as, as hell's fire. It is the, the beautiful stones that just blossomed, that, that just came forth. He said, you walked among them. You were entirely pure from the day that you were created until wickedness came in. It crept into your life, and then you became evil. Now, this is God's picture of the devil. He created him just like he created the angels. He was perfect in every way. He ruled the Garden of Eden. That was one of his jobs. The Bible tells us that he was a magnificently beautiful angel, that there were none that equaled his beauty. Radiant. And God blessed him with everything that he could shower upon him in greatness. Everything. He lacked nothing. He was anointed by God to be a protector of the garden. The place that God created where he would eventually put man. This was the protector of it. The ruler of it. And it said he had everything that a person could want. He was the leader. The second in command in heaven. Only below God. And he said, so in that, in that position, he ruled and he reigned and he was great until evil came in, sin. Everyone will have to choose to serve God. The angels were created, not born. And the angels never had an opportunity to choose God. They were just angels. They were his servants. They did whatever he wanted. But angels just like us must be tested. They must choose God. And somehow, some way, and we're not, we're not given that picture, but evil in Satan's mind. He said one day, I want to be like God. I can rule. I can be God. I've got everything it takes. And I want to be God. When evil entered into him, he then went to all the angels, told them his plan. And his plan was to overthrow God and be God. And he said, I want you to follow me. They all were tempted to sin. The Bible says that a third of the angels went with him. God, understanding what was going on, put that up rising down and very quickly and kicked the devil and all of his angels out of hell, out of heaven. They were kicked out. So now you see where sin comes into him <clears throat> and part of the angels and they then are kicked out of heaven. Those who followed Christ remained. Those who rejected were gone. Thus you see the beginning of evil. 
Satan goes from ruling the Garden of Eden as God's servant to now living there as a serpent. It is it, uh, not as a serpent. He was living there as an angel, but he was an evil angel. And then we find the story of God creating man and woman. And then the temptation that follows and the fall of man. So you see the fall of the angels, then you'll see the fall of man. Now, Satan, once he was kicked out, was forever mad. He thought in his own mind that he could rule God. He thought he could replace God, but there is none anywhere in the universe that is more powerful than God. None that could fit, defeat him. Never ever has been, never ever will be. Now we need to understand that Satan has power. He does. He does have certain powers. But Satan's powers revolve around deception, innuendos, trickery, magic, if you want. He doesn't have the power to overthrow God. He doesn't have the power to take me and you to hell. He does have the power of deception. And with deception, he tries to lure us. You see, he deceived those angels into believing that he was going to overthrow God. I mean, he was a powerful, he could, he could talk, he had the tongue. And they believed him. How, how, could, how could these angels believe that Satan could, or it wasn't known Satan, but the devil could, could overthrow God. They did. What, what did Satan do to make Eve think that she needed to eat something that God had told her not to eat? You see, he, he is very masterful in his ability to sway people through deception. He's still alive and well today. Those angels who were perfect, he deceived them, they fell. Adam and Eve who were perfect, he deceived them, they fell. You and I who are not perfect, what chance do we have against the devil? What chance do we have? Think about it. If he could, if he could deceive the very elite, what chance do we have? And the answer to that question the chance that we have is for us to understand who the devil is, understand who God is, and believe and have faith in God that we can be overcomers through the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide our lives. And that's the whole crux of it. I believe today that this message is timely. I Saturday, Becky came and she prayed for me. And when she prayed, she said, Father, we know that Danny has a message prepared on the devil. And we know that the devil is trying to stop him from preaching that message. Amen. Hadn't even thought about it. I had told her earlier what the message was going to be because it was concerning the article that was going to go in the bulletin. So she knew I was going to be preaching on Satan. But it had not even crossed my mind when all this mess started with my body that it was to stop me from preaching this message. So when she said that prayer, that's when I knew I'd be here today. I knew that. Because I will preach the message because the message is very important for God's people. And I want you to know I love every one of you. And I love you so much that I will be willing to suffer to get the truth out to you. So that you can make good decisions in your life. And you can only make good decisions if you have good information. And I'm trying to give you good information. Now I want us to look. <clears throat> the only being or the only person 
that has more names in the Bible than God is the devil. If you go through the Bible and you begin to read the Bible, you will see all the names that's referred to as God, all the names that he has. Well, Satan is referred to in the Bible throughout with many different names. He does not have as many names as God, but he has a lot of them. In the Bible, especially during the old times, I've told you before, there was great emphasis placed on names during the Bible. You didn't just go out and do like we do today, see how many of us can get a name that can't pronounce, get a name that nobody's used before, create something new, create something different. You know, that that's, that's just seems what we do. We, there's not a whole lot of attention placed on a name anymore. What, what does the name Danny mean? Not a much a lot of attention to that. You just choose something. But in the Bible, they chose names very carefully. Each name meant something. And when people start talking about the devil, the names that have been, he's been used, have been referred to him, are names that are very important. Now, I'm going to read to you some of these names this morning because I want you to see them and want you to understand them. I'll try to do this very quickly. Some of the names he's called is he's called the accuser, the accuser of the brethren. Of the brethren. This is in the book of Revelation. He's called that adversary. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the one who goes against you, the one who hates you, the one who's fighting against you, your adversary, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's called the angel of light. You see, that doesn't even make sense to us until we talk about the Garden of Eden. He appeared, he, he was, he was, if he was the most beautiful angel of all the angels, it does not say that God took a knife and marred his face up and kicked him out of heaven. It said he was kicked out of heaven. So we have to assume he still had his radiant beauty when he roamed the earth in the Garden of Eden. But for some reason, he had to deceive Adam and Eve, especially Eve to begin with. So he told her, he came to her as an angel of light, understanding. And he said to her, God won't let you eat of that fruit because if you eat of that fruit, you'll have wisdom and knowledge, just like God. You'll be as smart as God. An angel of light, he brings understanding, illumination. If you're in a black room and you turn a light on, all of a sudden there's illumination, you can see. The devil wants to come to me and you and bring illumination, but he wants to bring that illumination of himself as being good. So he, he said to her as an angel of light, I want you to know that you can eat that and you surely won't die. Good gracious, God loves you. He wouldn't kill you. And she ate of it and she died spiritually immediately. You see, that's powerful. He has the ability to appear as an angel of light to bring wisdom to you that you think is from God, but he is deceiving you and you got to know that. He is called the angel of the bottomless pit. We know there's a bottomless pit. We know there's a hell. We know that those who follow Satan are going to hell. There will be a day where we will all be judged. And he is the angel of that. He is the head of that. He's called the Antichrist. He will appear at some point. And as the Antichrist and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. The Antichrist is a spirit. We talk about him being a person. And, you know, you've heard all these names about this is going to be the Antichrist. This is, he's going to be, he's going to be, he's going to be. No, the Antichrist is a spirit. The Antichrist is the spirit of the devil that is going to be placed upon some human being and that person is going to rule later on in the tribulation. He's going to rule as an evil leader. But it is the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit that is against God, Antichrist, against God. It is that spirit. He is called a beast. He's referred to as Beelzebub, a ruler of the demons. He's referred to as Belial. He is a deceiver. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He's called the devil, the dragon. He's referred to as the enemy, 
the evil one. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. That was Jesus Christ himself praying for me and you. He's called the father of lies, the king of the bottomless pit. He's the angel of the bottomless pit. And here it calls refers to him as the king. He rules that place. He's called Lucifer, a murderer, the power of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, a roaring lion, the ruler of demons. All those angels that fell with him, they became his angels. They became demons, and he's the ruler of them all, the ruler of this world, this world. He's referred to, of course, we know as a star, a thief, the wicked one, a liar. These names were given to him because they denote something very special about his personality. There is not one good name that Satan has. In every thing I've ever written, in every book, in every article, I have never, ever capitalized the word Satan. Never have. Never capitalized the word devil. If I, if I began a sentence and I would say, Satan is so-and-so and so-and-so, I would have to capitalize it because it's in first word of the sentence. So I just reword the sentence, take it and move it. I'm not giving him that respect. And every time I do that, the computer tries to correct it. And they say, no, you've got this wrong. It's got to be capitalized. And I say, computer, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm writing this. And I will not give him the honor of capitalizing his name. See, we need to live that kind of way. Because I understand who he is. He's a liar. He's a thief. He has, he, the power he has is only limited to deception. He does not deserve honor like God deserves honor. I'll capitalize God, but not Satan, because he doesn't deserve that honor. He doesn't need to be placed there by God. And we need to understand that, but you can only do it if you know who he is. So you see his history. But what about his power? We talk about the power of Satan. And I will tell you that Satan has power, and he does. I have power. I want you to know that. And I can show it to you if I was to bring old Jed up here. I could throw him around and knock him around and put him down and make him cry like a little girl and say, I give up, I give up, Uncle Danny, quit. <laughs> but if I bring John up here, now we got a different story. He would fling me around. He'd make me say some things. So I do have power. I have power over someone that I can defeat, but I don't have power over someone that can defeat me. So the devil does have power. He certainly does. He has power to those people who call him a God. He has power over those people who serve him. But anyone who is a child of God he does not have power over them because the Bible plainly says that greater is the God that lives within me than the devil that lives outside of me. If you keep Satan where he belongs, he has no power over you and he cannot do one thing to you that you will not let him do. I said it in one of the books. I've said it to you before. He cannot come here and drink out of this glass, period, unless I give him permission to. See, because I have that power through God. We need to understand that. We don't have to fear him. We need to respect who he is and not respect as awe that we do for God, but respect the power, the fact that if we're not careful, we'll give in to him and because he has that deception. And so we must be ever vigilant to watch out what we say, what we do, and where we go, and what we believe. We must do that because he is there. Jesus is the only one that can overcome Satan. The only one. So he does have some power. But we don't have to fear it. Once he gets you, he controls you, and you are a slave to him, in bondage to him, forever and ever. Understand that. You will always be a slave. You will always be in bondage. Because you're either a slave to the devil or a slave to God. You're either bound by the devil or bound by God. 
You're either in bondage to the devil or bondage to God. We're always going to be that, somewhere, somewhere. But we've got to make sure that our allegiance is in Jesus Christ and we sell out our life to Jesus Christ and we're in bondage to him, a servant to him, because as long as we are, he protects his children. And like a good shepherd, he has a sling that he can use and he can fire that thing off and kill anything that the devil brings to us because the enemy's job is to steal the sheep of God, but our shepherd will not allow him to do that. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. The devil leads an army of the evil spirits. He does have an army. He does have evil spirits. He does have demons. And he leads that army, and he is in control of them. And he desires to lead the whole world astray. That's what he wants to do. He hates God. And I've, I've said this before, and I hope you can understand it. The devil hates God, and the devil hates us. His purpose is to get us, deceive us, and to take us to hell. That's his purpose. Now, the reason for it is because he hates God. He, you know, he hates me and you, but he doesn't, he doesn't hate Ricky because, you know, his name is Ricky, I mean, Ricky hasn't done anything really to make the devil hate him. Everything that is vested towards him is simply because the devil hates God. He tried to overthrow God. He couldn't do it. God kicked him out of heaven. He is destined to be in a devil's hell. Bet on that. So he wants to hurt God because God hurt him. He can't hurt God physically so he goes after his, God's most precious thing on this earth, his children. If he can get God's children and take them to hell, then that hurts God. See, so his whole hate and purpose is towards God. We just happen to be in the way. And he's trying to get to us because he wants to hurt God. Now, don't let him do that. I mean, every time we sin, we are hurting God. God. Think about it. Every time we sin, we're giving in to the devil who already hates us. Why would we want to agree with him? He says you're bound in sin. He is a liar. You're not bound in sin. You can come out anytime you want to. All you have to do is turn your heart to Jesus Christ, confess your sins, and believe that he is the Savior of the world, that he died for you, and that through him you can live, and through him he will break every bondage in your life. Do that, and you can be set free. Amen. It's that simple. But we've been taught by the devil to say things like, I just can't do it. I've tried all my time, and I want to break all these habits, and I just can't do it. I just, I just can't quit doing this, and I just can't quit doing that. I've tried, and oh, God, no, have mercy on me. You can say it all you want to. You've been deceived. That's all. God's word says you can do all things through Christ. All things. You've been deceived. And you don't believe it. Think about this. You don't believe you've been deceived. You know why? Because you've been deceived. If you're a Christian, you know who the devil is. You know he's bad. You know the things he brings on you is bad. If you're already controlled by the devil, you don't see him as the devil. You see him as something good. You see? How many of you have seen the sign we got out front? You don't read that anymore when you do the bulletin, do you? It's right out front. The party in hell has been canceled due to fire. I love that. Due to fire. A lot of people think there's going to be a party in hell. Oh, we go, I, used to, I used to listen to some of the, the rock and roll groups that would sing about the party in hell. Boy, we're going to have a good time in hell. We're going to do we're going to, Yeah, well, the party's been canceled because of fire. Hell is real. There won't be a party there. But to those who are already controlled by Satan, they believe that. See? So... Are you saying that you can't stop these things in your life because you've tried and I can't do it? You're saying the same thing. You can do it through Jesus Christ. 
You just got to be willing to pay the price that Jesus has already paid for us. You got to be willing to accept it and let Jesus help you out of any bad situation in your life. I just can't help thinking these bad thoughts. I just can't, these bad memories in my life just controlling me. I was just messed up as a child and I just can't do right. And I just don't, I just don't, I just don't. You're bound through deception and you need to get out of it. Your mind needs to be set free from the lies of the devil. The bondage that's controlling you needs to be set free and it can the moment you turn to God, recognize him, ask him to come into your life and let him kick the devil out one more time. Heaven is a real place. God lives in heaven. And I'll give you a thought you can think about and play with it. When Jesus Christ moves into your heart, that's heaven. He's already kicked him out of one heaven. He'd love to kick him out of another one. Your heart. Because God and the devil cannot rule in the same place. And when God's on the throne of your heart, he opens the door and kicks the devil out. See, that's important. And that is what we've got to live towards. Oh, the devil has some power, but not the power that God has. The devil will continue to attack God's people until the day God's people dies. So God's people must continue to resist the devil until the day that we die. Because he cannot overcome God's people. He can't do it. He can't do it. We just got to be strong. So we know his history. I've shown you a little bit about his power. Through God, we have all power. Now, what's the devil's plan? Last point. What's his plan? He's got a purpose. He's got a plan. First of all, the devil's plan is to make sin seem small. To make sin a little less offensive. To, to color it a neutral color. God says it's black. A heart full of sin is black. Rotten, no good. Jesus wants to come in there and wash it and make it white as snow. So the devil wants to paint it a different color. Let's just go with something neutral. Let's make it a tan, a light brown. Don't like if you talk about being black. He wants to make sin less offensive. He wants to water it down so you will think it's not so bad. Let me give you an example. A hundred years ago, <clears throat> sociology in their textbooks, that was their major textbook that all sociologists used, a hundred years ago, anyone who was a homosexual, they were referred to as homosexuality was referred to as perversion. Perversion. Going against that which is natural. That was a hundred years ago. Now, watch the progression. The devil wants to make sin less offensive. So watch the progressive now in homosexuality. First, it was perversion. Then it became a mental disorder. Then it became an alternative lifestyle. And today, <laughs> when we look at it, we call it normal sexual behavior. God called it sin. Sin. He still calls it sin. But man has changed their idea because Satan has placed in their mind a different word. You don't hate somebody because the Bible says you can't hate. The Bible says hate is a sin. So we're Christians. We don't hate. I just don't like you. See? I don't have to be around you. But I don't hate you. See, we've changed the words. And it's not the word. It's the sin in our heart. 
Hate is a sin. Not the word hate. See, we can change the word. The, but the spirit, the sin, still is in our heart. We call it something else. But the root of it is still there. Still festering. And will still take us to hell. God called homosexuality sin. So we change the word. And we change that word to sound better. So I'm no longer perversion. It's just a natural sexual lifestyle. So I've changed it. Now, but in here it's still sin. That sin still is in you. And you call it anything you want to. But when God calls it sin, he's the judge. Amen. I had never in my lifetime heard the word triest. Do you know what that word is? The first time I ever heard the word was when PTL, Jim Baker, got caught having an affair with another woman. Getting up and preaching the gospel on TV worldwide, this and that and the other, and then run home and go out and had a girlfriend. He was married, but had a girlfriend on the side. When he got caught, the newspapers, who had been proclaiming him as the great savior or great gospel preacher, blah, 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 they said Jim Baker caught in a triest. And I thought, what? So I had to go to the dictionary and look it up. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> It's another word of saying having a sexual affair. So they didn't want to blast it everywhere that he got caught in a sex act with another woman. He had a triest. I thought, God help us. He committed adultery. It's called a sin by God. Man can change the word, but the sin's still there. And God will deal with us with the sin in our heart, not what we call it on the outside. If it's wrong today, by God's standard, it'll be wrong tomorrow. Call it anything you want to. And we are good at playing that game. Second, the devil wants to make heaven uh, less appealing. How can you make heaven less appealing? By letting man have it good here. Jesus tells us in his word that until we get to heaven, he will let us have some heaven here on earth. But he's not talking. Listen, do you, do, do you see, and I, give me just a couple more minutes. Do you, see, do you see all the money that's in the world today? You see it? Yes, you do. Do you have it? No, you don't. But we see it, don't we? All of these golden things, all of these cars, all of these mansions, we see it all over the TV the lifestyles of the rich and famous. We see, we read things on the TV that literally blows our mind. We can't even count the zeros behind money that people have. And they can't even find ways to spend it. They have to create ways to spend their money. And it's getting greater and greater and greater. So we can have anything we want. I mean, they can do anything. They're buying islands because they don't have anything else to do. They're spending $30 and $40 million on a house because they don't have anything to do with their money and they need a tax break. Can, can, can you imagine, and I do, I, I wonder sometimes, how would it be if, if I could do anything I wanted to and money not be an object? One great golfer said the other day, they were asking him about this big tournament, and if he won it, it was a bunch of money involved in it. And they said, will you change so-and-so and so-and-so -so to give yourself a better chance to win this tournament? He said, no. He said, at this stage in my life, I'm just happy to be able to know that money does not determine what I do. I've got plenty of it. See? What would it be like just to have enough money? I, go to, I, go, I, I could just go hop on a plane today and go to Hawaii. Stay day or stay a week doesn't make any difference. I can hire somebody to take me all. I mean, just anything you, in your imagination, what could you do? What would you do with it? Well, there are people doing that. So they have no appeal for heaven. They got heaven on earth. 
I'm going to have to float around in heaven like an angel all day long. And just, and, 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 no, I got heaven here, man. I can go anywhere I want to. I can do anything I want. To. Now, I understand we're not that rich. But do you understand that the devil plays the same game with me and you? Because whatever our limitations are, we can still do whatever we want to in our limitations. See, we, don't, we no longer are greatly desiring that because the devil is making it less appealing. So our desire and goal sometimes is not to get to heaven, but don't you want to go to heaven and see the streets of gold? Uh, not really. What about all the, the pearls and all the gates made of all these pearls? And, not really. What about the beautiful sights of, of, of waterfalls? And, and you, no, I'm... I've seen some on TV. It's just out of this world, man. We got the most beautiful place. I saw a program the other day that was just showing beautiful hidden spots that you could go to and go swimming, and they were just out of this world. See, less appealing. Don't get caught in that trap. It can't be less appealing. Number three is to make hell less horrific. Make heaven less appealing so we won't have a desire to go there, but make hell sound not so bad. One day I'll, I'll preach a sermon on hell. And in my own mind, I can't imagine it. Total darkness, but yet there's fire there. See, how does that happen? So the devil makes us think that hell's not so bad. We'll have a party. We'll rejoice. We'll have a good time. We'll have rock and roll bands. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. You think that whenever your mind's controlled by him. You see? So he's trying to make hell. And finally, he wants to make the gospel of Jesus Christ less appealing to us. Is he doing that? I give you a quiz. Do not, re, do not raise your hand. Do not vote out loud. The gospel, less appealing. How many of you honestly could not wait to get here this morning to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached? The gospel, less appealing. How many of you have a daily, regular routine of reading God's word? Make the gospel less appealing. How many of you have not watched a Christian program on TV? Make the gospel less appealing. We have all these programs on TV, and we'll watch them regularly. We'll even stay home from church to watch a TV programs sometimes. Make the gospel less appealing. Think about it. When's the last time that you read a Christian novel? But you read other novels all the time. Make the gospel less appealing. See, we're letting other things become more important than the gospel, and we don't even see ourselves doing it. We're letting events be more important than the gospel. We're letting other things because the gospel is being watered down to the point that other things are being lifted up and the devil is making the gospel less appealing. We come to church and we talk about all the things of the world. And then when we go to a party, how many of you talk about the things of God? Mm -mm. We talk about the things of the world at the parties. Now we come to church and talk about the things of the world. We don't want to pray like we used to pray. We no longer want to be prayed for. Because we really don't believe in the healing power of God. Until we get cancer. And only have a few days to live. Then, yeah, well, that's a little bit different. But in regular day life, we don't even want to be prayed for. Why is that? I can handle it. I've been to the doctor. I got some medicine, blah, blah, blah. And we find ourselves, then the gospel has been watered down 
and he's no longer our healer. He's God. He's no longer our Savior. He's God. Because it's been watered down. God help us from falling into that trap. Oh, the devil's a sly old fox. If I could catch him, I'd put him in a box, and I'd lock the box, and throw away the key for all those dirty tricks he played on me. It's a good song. We just don't live it, do we? See? So Jesus loves you. The devil hates you. Now, I'm going to follow this up, not tonight, but I'm going to follow this up with another sermon, and we're going to look at it. But I hope you've learned something from this morning. The devil is very real, very real. He's a deceiver. Everything that exists around him is through deception. You don't have to be deceived. God opens eyes by opening the heart. We do all the things on the outside. God works in the heart. You let Christ come in here. Then he will open your eyes to see things you've never seen before. He'll let you see how bad the devil is. He'll let you hear the truth of what the devil is saying. See, we just hear something. God lets you hear the truth. You need to be set free. I want to pray with you this morning. And I want you to, if, if you need Christ to come into your heart this morning, you pray that prayer. If you've been deceived, you've been given one more chance today to get it right. The devil is a liar and a loser. God is everything. But who rules your life? Bottom line. Who rules it? The one who rules it is the one you obey. If you're not obeying God's word, then guess who rules your life? We need to get it straight. You can do that right now, this morning, sitting there in your seat. Be serious for a moment. Father, I ask you to look upon this congregation. You know every one of us in here by name. You know every one of us in here by our heart. It's not what we say or do on the outside. It's what we are on the inside. Now, Lord, I ask you to look upon this congregation today and have mercy. Every one of us, every one of us have been deceived by the enemy at some point in our life, been deceived. We've been allowed to believe things that were lies. We've been allowed to play games. We've grown colder to your word, colder to your worship, colder to your songs, colder to prayer. We just don't have that burning desire anymore to do them because it's become a ritual. We don't understand that the problem's in us. It's our heart. We think about things, well, the preacher makes me mad. Well, he preaches too long. Or, well, he does this and he does. We let excuses from somewhere else control us. And we refuse to see the problems in us. It's our heart. Because we've been deceived and we're bound and we can't see any farther than that. Now I'm asking you, Lord, would you please forgive us? Every person in here this morning, God, that's asking you right now, would you forgive them? What you call sin is still sin. I don't care what the world says today about it. It's still sin. Sin will take us to hell. Don't care what the world tells us. Your word, your word, forgive us. Father, I ask you to come into anyone's life who's asking you right now. Come into their life and set them free today. Make them new creations in you. Show them how they can change if they want to. I thank you because you promise us that you're an overcomer. And Satan never ever has stopped you, never will. Thank you because we love you and you love us. And we pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.